Excellent. Um, thank you very much and a huge welcome to many of the Commonwealth Bank clients um, and lots of our people in the audience. And it's an absolute pleasure to have um, CEOs of three of the Australian largest corporates um, on the ASX. I did just want to quickly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, the Gadigal people of the Enora Nation, and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Now, I was going to start with a different question. I know we've been briefed, but it's very hard um, when you've just sat through um, that presentation, I think, not to reflect. And um, actually, was the last question we talked about in terms of how each of you goes about learning um, and taking into account just the wide range of perspectives and stakeholders um, that are in this domain. Um, so maybe a bit of a reflection on, on Chad and Hunter and how you think about kind of keeping up with an evolving space. Um, Vicky? Yeah, look, it, wasn't it? it was so wonderful just sitting listening to that. And I must admit, um, for me, it's a broad question for me right at the moment in this space. I'm just um, coming up to two months in my new role. And I've got to say, this space is changing so fast. So for me, it is engaging with a broad range of people. Um, and I'd have to say in our household, my two teenage daughters play a p pretty important role of um, keeping it front of mind just personally beyond what we do as a company. So it was great to hear that today. So thank you. Fantastic. Matt? Yeah, look, no, thank you. And, and thanks to both uh, Alan and Vicky for, for coming on this morning. It, it, it's a really difficult topic. And having watched a lot of those documentaries, of course, and, and not just that, it, it can be really sort of moving. And it's, you know, I, th I think at times I think it's hard explaining it to your children as well. I, I think specifically at the moment, there's a few things, as you know, Sally, we're really focused on. I mean, the topic itself, I would say, um, you know, each time you understand a little bit more, you understand a lot more things that you that you don't. I mean, we're doing some work with CSIRO, which no doubt we'll talk about. We had a session with them last week, and we we're just sort of talking about floods. You know, we used to worry about weather events in Australia, really, in some terms of cyclones in Queensland. Now it's basically all the way down the east coast, mm. and sort of, you know, a pretty stark message is, irrespective of what we're doing around decarbonisation over the next decade, that's just going to get worse. Yeah. There's enough sort of locked in to that to that path. And so, you know, that's very challenging. You know, we've had a lot of conversation in the last couple of days over the, after the budget about energy prices, you know, looking at sort of 56%. You know, I just came back from uh, a trip to Europe, you know, countries like Germany up 600%. Uh, I think of your IEA, it's an international energy agency, which a lot of the scenario planning gets based on. They've come out, I think they're about to do an update tonight, uh, but they're sort of talking about this is sort of, you know, a truly uh, global disruption to energy. Uh, and then I think, you know, we, we also sort of feel the weight of what we should be doing. Well, obviously, we're going to talk about it in more detail. How do, how do we help support the Australian economy, lead the transition, support our customers, be science-based? There are still sort of divergent views, and it's not simple. In, an, you know, in a number of those areas, it's, a, you know, from my perspective, and even in role, it's something that we and the board and my leadership team, we spend an enormous amount of time on it, and it really feels like it's necessary and worthwhile. And I will, uh, first of all, Matt, can I thank you and the Commonwealth Bank for having us all here. It's great to be invited to such a great event. Um, I thought that last session was very inspirational, and it's interesting how to get a message across for keeping people engaged, mm. which I thought was fa fascinating. Um, for me, I think the big thing is like you do as a CEO, I think every day, it's actually to get experts in to, to give you a lot more information. We just had our safety conference and part of our safety, which is a big event in Qantas, as you can imagine. And part of that, we're now dedicating time uh, to ESG issues. And we had people talking about uh, what the developments are in aviation. And I love the technology side of it, what you can do in technology to improve things. Being a physicist and a mathematician originally, uh, buying aircraft, one of my jobs in a number of airlines was fleet planning, going out there, buying aircraft, and figuring where this technology could go and how it could impact and, and solve some of the environmental issues. But I also think there's nothing better than getting out in the field. So we do a big carbon offset program, the biggest offset program of any airline in the world. 10% of our customers offset their carbon emissions. And we've gone out to see some of those programs in action and see what they do to, to help the environment. And I'm on the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, so also going out to see actually some of the damage that 
um, but uh, climate change is actually causing and seeing in real life what that is like. And it, if nothing like that inspires you to make a change and encourages you to make a change, I don't think anything will. So I'd be encouraging people to listen to those experts, understanding what's happening, what they do in all parts of our lives, and then using that information to see what you can do to make a difference. Fantastic. So in our audience, we actually have many um, CEOs, CFOs, sustainability um, people who are all looking at how they lead in the change. And um, you know, we've talked a bit about the heart, and I want to talk a little bit about head, and you know how each of you are thinking about your own sustainability strategies. And I think it's great that we've got you know telco, a bank, and an airline, um, because it's surprising actually in some senses that there are similar golden threads that run between them, um, and applications that are probably broader than just for your own institution. So. Um, I think it'd be good just maybe to step through the kind of core tenets of each of the sustainability strategies and maybe how core you see that in terms of your overarching strategy. Do you want me to yes, oh, I'll go. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so it might be a bit of a surprise actually for people in the audience, but as Telstra, uh, we're actually the 13th largest scope two emitter in the country. So every time you're watching a Netflix video, you're doing your online banking or booking your airline ticket or you're doing a Teams call, it's generating a lot of data, a lot of bits over our network. So, and that keeps requiring more electricity. So absolutely for us, it's core. We know we've got to take very urgent and proactive action. And there's, there's three core parts of our climate ambitions that sit right in our core of our corporate strategy. And so, um, the first one is to reduce our overall emissions by 50% by 2030. Uh, the second one is to enable renewable energy generation equivalent to 100% of our energy consumption by 2025 and to be carbon neutral, which we've been since um, 2020. So that's in our corporate strategy. It's not on the side, it's measured, it's part of our scorecards, part of tracking our performance. But it also, um, not only are those specific measures in there, it does uh, play right back into our core of our strategy. So if I think about a few obvious or clear areas, firstly, um, I look at our operating costs, like every big company trying to be more efficient. Um, the first thing I'd say is we drive our emissions down, obviously that drives demand for our electricity down and brings our costs down. The second thing, um, we have supported through very long-term power purchase agreements, uh, big renewable projects, and right at the moment, Matt just referenced the amazing pressure that we're seeing on power prices. That's actually helping us, um, not only helping support renewable energy projects, but it's helping us manage that volatility. Um, the second area, we talked about customers, how do we support and enable them? So many customers are looking for those lower emission products and services and <clears throat> you know we're in the thick of helping customers migrate to cloud computing that's 80 percent up to 80 percent less emissions when you move to the cloud versus on premise um, so that's playing a part we're definitely we're now using a shadow carbon price in our long-term investments and that's important because you know those extreme weather events we've modeled forward to 2050 and as telstra those impacts on our network cumulative cost-wise, we estimate about 2.4 billion. So making decisions today that have long-term impacts is important. And I think finally, our people, it matters. Um, we talked about the emotion of watching that video. This just matters to our teams. And so for me, clear commitments, we've got to take urgent action. They matter, it's the right thing to do, but it absolutely plays back then into a sustainable business that's delivering long-term good results as well. Yes, excellent. And Matt, maybe um, picking up some of those themes, um, looking at Commonwealth Bank's own sustainability strategy, there'll be many common threads. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, look, the, the, the very short answer would be it's, it's absolutely central, and you keep me on track here with time, Sally, because it's a do, topic I think we can yeah. spend a little bit of time on. But maybe up front, well, at least, uh, trying to dimension a little bit in terms of financial services and our own emissions, at least it's helped me, because we put out, as you know, a lot of disclosure, we put out a, a standalone sort of 81 page climate report, which is fantastic. It's also, there's a lot of material in it, but in terms of the bank, 
way we think about it, sort of scope one, scope two, and upstream scope three, which you think about it in terms of direct power generation and everything other than indirect. We're down 34% over the last two years. We're 100% renewable energy, put solar panels on branches, a lot of things that we've done. All of that's really, really important but it's tiny in the scheme of things, given the nature of our operation for financial services and for banks. It's all about what are the emissions that are generated by the customers that we lend money to. We think about that in the context of scope three finance emissions. And that in and of itself is a dimension between the two. So that one, two and upstream three versus finance, 500 times larger, the emissions in that latter category. So understandably, huge amount of our focus has gone into a you know, a very sort of thoughtful way to both disclose and understand that. Then if you, you, know, you dial down, what's the thing that's of most interest and focus, we just came through, I think all three of us, our AGMs, huge topic around fossil fuels. So you know, we, we have a uh, trillion dollar balance sheet. Less than half of 1% is lending to fossil fuel. It's down by 60% uh, over the last five years. And I don't say that defensively, but even though it's tiny, it's 27% of our total financed emissions. So you can sort of understand, and I say that again against the context of, uh, you know, an energy, I don't like using the word crisis too often, but I think genuinely an energy crisis over the next few years and trying to work through our role. So how does that then translate into our strategy? You know, number one is of course, you know, lending to support the transition to our customers, uh, you know, broadly, we think about that in a number of different ways, but sustainable lending, sort of 30 billion of a 70 billion dollar target. Cumulative over the last two years, there's a whole range of different products, uh, sustainability linked loans, etc., uh, that fit into that. So second is sort of, again, helping our customers through the transition. We think it's really important, uh, and clearly given the scale of that business, it's not critical or anything close to it. It's almost immaterial from an economic perspective mm -hmm. for the bank. But actually, it's a really important role to support Australia, the economy, our communities, our customers, make that transition, certainly if, if and where they can. And there's lots of things that we do around helping our retail customers understand their emissions, helping them finance the capex to put solar panels, batteries, there's a whole range, and as well as like sort of solutions all the way through. And then thirdly, uh, we're doing a lot of work, I mentioned, um, with CSIRO, um, to try and basically publish the decarbonisation scenarios across critical sectors for the Australian economy, which are obviously grounded in science and specific to the Australian situation. Our hope is obviously we publish it, we want to make that available. And to sort of make that real, you know, it, it does things in terms of, you know, we're committed to a one and a half degree uh, scenario. So then it sort of breaks down what are the technology and like you, Alan, I think it's like one of the most interesting parts of the role, what are all the different technology shifts that need to occur? And then in a particular sector, uh, let's say residential property, which is obviously a big part of our exposure, you gotta make assumptions about how much of that comes from electrification mm. uh, and decarbonisation of the grid, how much comes from the changes to the building code construction standards that reduces emissions, how much of it comes from appliance, uh, reducing intensity, and simply, we want to be allocating capital to support both the technologies, the transition, and so there's an enormous amount of sort of work and thought and complexity that comes into it, but it's absolutely central strategically uh, and to all of our stakeholders, um, you know, customers, but, you know, I totally agree with you, Vicky, for, from our people's perspective, it's extremely important, mm. and, and, you know, we quite rightly you know, we will be challenged internally if people don't feel like we're making enough progress because the evidence is becoming, you know, uh, more significant and larger every day. Yeah, so I mean, as a banker, I can reflect that, um, you know, we used to spend a lot of time looking at everybody's annual financial statements, working through your strategic plans and determining kind of what the right approach is. And now I'd say many of us would pick up the sustainability reports or to the extent that they're standalone climate reports almost first to try to understand you know, what that plan actually is and what your capex alongside it might look like and where we're actually gonna be able to lean in. So Alan, you've obviously got a, a very interesting business um, in the sense that it will have um, more challenges than most because of the technological aspects. And maybe it'd be helpful to understand a bit from Qantas's um, perspective on the sustainability strategy side. Yeah, so I think we haven't had our AGM yet. Right. It's next week, okay, but I'm sorry. sure, I'm sure <laughs> the Empire, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, and I'm sure the environmental stuff will be a part of it. We'll probably have a few other issues on as well. Yeah. Uh, 
So, so for, for us, I suppose, one of the things I think is, first of all, absolutely our customers, our employees, our shareholders, and the general community, I want you to do something in this space. It's, it's unique to all stakeholders. And I think with aviation, I think what COVID has actually taught us, when you lose something, which we did, you couldn't travel, um, you value it even more. You know, and those scenes when the borders opened up, of grandmother seeing the grandkids for the first time, people uh, going to see dying relatives, the economic impact, you know, we had to operate from the government thousands of flights that they paid for to get agricultural products out of the country because the borders were closed mm -hmm. that saved 120,000 jobs. The amount of businesses that couldn't meet customers, couldn't miss suppliers, the economic impacts were huge. And we, I think we value it even more now as a consequence of losing it for a while. And for us, there is, there is a balance now because in Europe before COVID, People were flight shaming. People were saying, should people fly um, or, or protect the environment? And we shouldn't have it as that choice. It's our big driver. You should be able to protect the environment and fly. So that's the imperative for us. Um, and we, we call it, and our call to action is actually protecting air travel for future generations. Because we've all benefited from it. I wouldn't be here if I didn't get the benefits from air travel. I don't know how many people in the room wouldn't be here if there wasn't those benefits of being able to come down. And you want that for your kids, for your grandkids, for all the next generations, and then not being isolated to a continent that's just further from the rest of the world and can't travel. So there's a huge imperative to get it right. And so in 19, before COVID, we became the second airline group in the world to actually um, declare we were going to get to carbon neutral by 2050. And in the middle of COVID, uh, Andrew Parker, our chief sustainability officer is here, we created a role reporting to the chief executive. Um, it was the only area where we were cutting back everywhere uh, because we were losing so much money. It's the only area where we recruited people and started building them up because we thought it was the biggest challenge for our future. And in, in again, even with losing a lot of money, in, in March, we announced our interim targets and how we're going to get to net zero by 2050. And for us, there's a few pillars in that. First, we said by 2030, we'll get to 25% carbon reduction, CO2 reduction. Uh, we'll do that through sustainable aviation fuel, which is the main way of getting there. We're already buying SAV. 15% of our London operation is SAF fuel. Uh, we're going to be uh, buying millions of litres out of California, 20 million from 25. And that has 80% less CO2 emissions. Uh, it is, we'll, we'll talk a bit later about technology, but it's, it's very hard to get electric aircraft to work and hydrogen aircraft are a long way away. So SAF is our main way of getting there. But we also have an efficiency in aircraft coming so Jetstar just took delivery of um, a NEO aircraft, a 321, that actually is all outperforming the technology we had before. It's 20% less uh, CO2 emissions. And like Vicky, it saves us fuel, and fuel is through the roof, so there's actually a commercial benefit of doing it. The 787s have that replaced the 74s are 25% more fuel efficient. Um, and we're doing things like we had the University of Sydney help us with robotics, so a little drone flying in the air to understand uh, weather patterns and pockets of air to improve the efficiencies of aircraft uh, flying. Uh, we're talking to Airbus, they have a plan uh, for flight formation, which is a good bit away, where it's literally, you know, great birds fly in a V shape, a lot of things you can learn from nature. And that actually uses uh, the efficiency of the, the weight behind the birds um, to reduce um, burn. And they've tested aircraft flying very close to each other, so there's a lot of things to get right before you do this commercially. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we won't do it until it's absolutely safe. But, but it reduces, it reduces uh, fuel burn on that second aircraft and CO2 emissions by 10% on long haul flights. It's massive. Yeah. Uh, potential. So it's that, that type of innovation that will help us with this new second category, which is 1.5% efficiency every year. And then the third, of course, is offsets, which will fill the gap until then. And you could see in our customer base, I mentioned 10% of our customers offset their emissions. 
And worldwide, that's only 1% in the aviation industry. So here, 10 times the amount of people are actually interested in doing it. And yesterday, we announced a new addition to that, uh, which is our, our reef, um, uh, uh, reef offsets, uh, where we're actually trying to help the Great Barrier Reef, where when you offset your flights, half a million dollars will go into buying reef credits, which encourages and helps farmers in, in northern Queensland stop fertilizer, uh, which produces nitrogen, and it flows off into the water and damages the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and this, we think, will have 90% of, of, of that fertilizer, 90% of, of, the, of the pollutants that get into water are from fertilizers. So you can help help protect that amazing Australian asset, amazing tourism location by doing this. And then we've also uh, put in place a whole series of management incentives. It's part of our um, KPIs going forward like everything else. I think everybody's doing this now. And our shareholders want us to do that. So it's part of how people are going to be rewarded in the future to make sure that we hit those targets over that period of time. I mean, it's a fascinating journey and it's interesting listening to an airline CEO talking about the Great Barrier Reef. And it shows you how multidisciplinary um, you know, things will need to be for us to get to resolution. I'm reflecting a little bit on, and you've got your AGM to come, we've had ours, um, you know, on the stakeholder approach that happens. You know, for Commonwealth, most of the questions that we would get would relate to our sustainability agenda. Um, they'll relate to all things from mining in the transition through water, through land rights, through you know, a bunch of different things. Some questions on the actual underlying business, but not that many. Um, maybe it's a bit of a question, and again, for, for each of you, about stakeholder management, um, really across investors, staff, customers. Um, that presumably is a relatively complex space to operate in. Um, how do you go about leading through that stakeholder group? Why don't I kick off? Because yeah. I think we've got a um, very consistent, broad group of stakeholders. Um, but the one I thought I might talk a little bit about, um, so for us, when we look at our scope one, two and three emissions, scope three makes up 62%. So, uh, and we brought scope three into our 50% emission reductions target by 2030 last year, uh, because we felt we had to play a proactive role, again, in working with our partners and suppliers. And, and there's been some good progress. So actually our scope three emissions are down about 31%, so that's good. But um, for us, how do we focus, how do we work together with that group um, is absolutely critical. And then inside those scope three emissions, actually 72% around that mark come from our suppliers. So we've got, um, you know, an incredible group of suppliers. Many of them are on, you know, a fair way along their journey as well. So what have we been focused on? The first thing I'd say is where we find partners that can make a real difference. And I would use for us Microsoft as one of the examples. We, we recently signed a deeper strategic partnership with them. And part of that actually relates to firstly, them working with us, particularly around their data insights capability to help us on our journey uh, around emissions reduction and sustainability. And secondly, working with them to help enable our customers. So as an example, we've brought our Telstra Data Hub and then we've brought together Microsoft's sustainability products to help customers on their journey. So that's important. Um, the second thing I'd highlight with suppliers that we're doing, uh, we're working with the, um, the one of the big projects around carbon and particularly around the supply chain program. So bringing together, at the moment we're focused on our top 100 suppliers and one of the challenges I think is getting consistency of reporting and understanding because you know suppliers across lots of geographies around the world, everyone's looking at it a bit differently, um, how they talk about and measure their climate um, activities and, and reduction. So we've had a big focus there and that's involved um, focus on reporting. We've provided some tools and some education and but at the end of the day, I think it's, a, it's an ecosystem we've all got a part to play in. You can't do it on your own. So I just think that supplier space for us has been an interesting one, Sally. We're probably 
I could talk about the others, but I think it's one that's um, still a challenge and we've really got to work together in. Yeah, and it is a partnership and it's one of those spaces where, again, it'll have a lot of um, corollaries across different industries in terms of you know solving those problems, getting that data problem um, sorted, understanding, and making sure that we kind of bring people alongside. Um, Matt, from your perspective of stakeholder engagement? Yeah, look, maybe a couple of things I, I touch on. I, I'd say um, it's still, obviously, it's a very complex and challenging uh, objective for the country and for the globe. I would say it's less divisive than it was a year or two years ago. There's an enormous amount of mobilisation across different industry uh, and, and across all areas. With investors as well, I feel like it's really accelerated. There's a lot of engagement, a lot of interest, a lot of questions. Um, and so we're, we're really um, trying to lean into and provide as much information and sort of helpful uh, guidance in and around that. I, look, at times I think, sometimes on the stakeholder part, we you feel it sharply when, and of course, you go and visit, as we did, sort of bushfire affected areas, you know, pre-COVID, flood affected areas, still sort of at the front line with people in terms of what it means to them sort of economically and socially, you know, I was in uh, Newcastle earlier in the year, we think there's about 800,000 people who are sort of their, their income or their livelihoods directly um, relying on the, you know, coal energy value chain. So, you know, that's a tough conversation with, you know, I've met with my customers and both parents were, were in that industry, what's going to happen to me? And so it's very much, you know, sort of we're right in the middle of all of that and then trying to understand um, a lot around, well, how do we best support that? How do we do what we can to provide, as I said, some of the sort of information about what we think is going to be required across, you know, multiple sectors. We're, you know, very interested in the sort of energy transition and what needs to happen over, the, you know, the next dec or decade or below. It's sort of part of that overall trying to understand the engagement with uh, our customers and the emerging technology policy makers. It's an ex the, bre the breadth of it. Uh, and, and hence why we have lots of people, including you, Sally, uh, who spend you know, a good part of, part of your time trying to get us sort of access and exposure to that and as best we can um, you know, sort of synthesise the information which is so rapidly uh, developing. And, and I think you know, we'd also, uh, I think the coordination and certainly sort of knowledge sharing uh, across corporate Australia is really dramatically increasing as well. And I suppose, I mean, very similar. So, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're engaging with all stakeholders. The interesting one with staff is when any, we have create green teams and the amount of people that volunteer to want to help on this is just mm -hmm. massive. Um, and Andrew, I think, is reinst reinstating that since COVID. But one stakeholder I might talk about, because it's got to be very important f for us in particular, is the governments on these things, because policy settings is really, really important. And it's interesting, you know, there's, there's no immediate technology solution for aviation except for SAF. And, uh, sustainable aviation fuel does work. We, we're flying aircraft on it and it's less, it takes 80% of the emissions out. You can't have a battery aircraft unless maybe for Sydney to Wagga, but the flying from Sydney to Melbourne the battery is the, the power to weight ratio is just crazy. You have to have 34 times the weight in batteries than you have on fuel. So you can imagine the size of that aircraft. And then the recharging of that aircraft once it lands, you wouldn't get many operations out of it each day. So, so there's not an electrical solution that works in aviation. And hydrogen is a good bit away. Airbus are trying to develop a hydrogen aircraft, uh, which they think will be ready in 2035, but that creates a lot of complexities because hydrogen has to be compressed and stored at very low temperatures and getting that to the aircraft because none of the distribution systems are set up. So SAF is the way to get there, um, at least for the short term and probably the biggest solution that we have. The trouble is the policy settings haven't been here for a long time. They're there in California, they're there in Europe, they're producing it. Um, it needs, like solar panels did at the start, incentives for that to be created, market signals for that to be created, um, and it will produce an industry. We spend $5 billion a year on aviation uh, jet currency. We think if you could get that as an industry in Australia, it would create at least 15,000 jobs. We employ 23,000 people. Buying our fuel could create nearly as many people which is unbelievable for the country. And most countries, when we're, we're talking to the guys in California and the UK, when Andrew Parker's doing the deals with them, 
they tell you that Australia has the one thing that the rest of the world wants, it's huge land mass and a feedstock. Mm. The feedstock is the issue, and we're exporting it. Some animal waste products we're putting into India, and we could be keeping it here, creating jobs, and having a massive impact on it. Now, the great news is we're having really good discussions with the Albanese government. Um, Chris Bowen is really focused on this and trying to he set up the Jet Zero Council for the whole aviation industry. It won't be just Qantas that would benefit from this, but the entire industry. And I think it's very exciting. Um, but that's a stakeholder management that is critical to making big change here, apart from your customers, your shareholders, um, and your employees. You need the right settings around government to set this up for the future. And I think it's really critical. The other thing that we see now with the Ukraine is energy security is also a massive thing. And having the ability for our own aviation industry, our military and commercial, to have its own fuel produced on shore, that's massive for the country. And we, sooner we get, sooner the better we get to that stage. Yes, that kind of um, le leads quite neatly, Alan, because um, we look at kind of you know really the environment is much more conducive, I think, to a broader range of stakeholder agreement as to what needs to be done. Um, I think there's a growing realization as to how urgent some of the challenges in decarbonization are. And for me, there's just a huge opportunity for Australia to both deliver into the global environment um, you know, and also to lead from within. And some of the things we talk about is you know, we're going to dig the transition out of the ground. So all of those requirements for copper and bauxite and manganese and kind of iron ore, et cetera, can't build wind farms and solar farms, et cetera, without all of that requirement. Um, we talk about being a carbon farmer for the world. Um, so really, you know, kind of again, leveraging that natural land mass, um, finding ways for us to actually be not just a net contributor in, the, in our own right, but also um, more for the globe. And then kind of getting to a decarbonized grid as far as you can gives us a real competitive advantage. You kind of touched on that um, just in terms of some of the cost benefit that might, might exist. So maybe um, a question for each of you, what are you hopeful for and how do you see Australia's role um, in this space? Um, and, and maybe starting um, with Matt, um, you know, are there are there spaces you think we can actually lean into as a country that will put us on the world stage um, in this regard? Yeah, I mean, look, there there, there are Sally, and look, Alan touched on it. I think yeah. that's the importance of the. I guess now clarity and consistency of ambition and target yeah. for country, and I think for you know for corporates. And then what are the what, what are the technologies? What are the assumptions that you need to make to be able to achieve that? And then I think we've got to look where where is the distinct advantage for Australia to be able to create new industries. And I, I think that the overall sort of economic transition and just transition as part of that over the next sort of you know 20 plus years is is extremely important. I mean. Yeah. You touched on a couple of them. You know, we sort of think about the the natural resources that Australia has, and that can be you know, evolved in lots of different ways. There's, there's going to be a growing demand for carbon, carbon offsets as a natural sort of, I think, um, opportunity to create those within Australia across our client base. Obviously, trying to develop that, and I think developing a market with you know, a very strong global uh, reputation is extremely important. I mean. We think about also, you know, as a financial institution, how do we make sure that the settings are right so that we can try and translate cost of capital reductions into better pricing? Because the incentives really do matter, and we can see that, and obviously that's discussed a lot at the moment around the energy. And you kind of you look at what's required at the sort of integrated uh, plan level, and the sort of 30 in, 30x increase in battery. You know, I think it's a 6x increase in grid scale, wind and solar. I mean, th th those things aren't just going to happen naturally overnight I mean th so there's got there's a lot I think there's roles for us in terms of how we can help to uh, you know advocate and sort of bring hopefully sort of facts and science to that support those emerging you know technologies and industries I mean I know there's a number of customers that we're talking to at the moment there's, there's some that are really innovating in areas like uh, battery we've got there's, there's huge opportunities in some of the just yeah. as you said both in the mineral but also some of the um, you know, value add in, in Australia and really trying to create a, um, you know, the next wave of that economic uh, story. And we're obviously doing that in an environment where, you know, people are worried about it, 
quite rightly, inflation's very high. A number of the things that we're talking about, you know, potentially inflationary, certainly the impact on energy is. So, you know, getting all of those things right, but ultimately we should be thinking about it you know, nationally. Yeah. How do we build a brighter future for Australia and for, uh, you know, all of our, the citizens? Yeah. Um, I, I, well, I can't add much more to that. I think that was a great answer. I think on t top of that, I would just say we're really excited about is the potential for this country. We have so many assets. People call it a lucky country. But the size of the land mass, as Matt's saying, the, the ability to produce this stuff here, the ability to be an energy leader worldwide is just massive. We just need to have the right signals, the right policy settings to allow us to, to tap into it. And what, what we're, we're pretty excited about is that uh, we should be in the lead in the world on this if you get this thing right. At the moment, the Europeans and the Americans are way ahead. I think the Australians are some of the most competitive people I've ever come across. <laughs> and we, maybe we should be making this into a World Cup of how we produce these things <laughs> even faster. Um, I think we would be winning that if that were the case. But I'm pretty excited about how far this country could come fairly rapidly if the right policy settings, the, the right determination, and the right focus is put on it. I think we could be world leaders in so many different areas, including on the aviation side. I mean, are we, we like a challenge on it where we did for Airbus and Boeing, we wanted to fly non-stop the unique issues we had here from Sydney and Melbourne to London and New York. We started that with a tweet to both manufacturers and said, there's a challenge here. Um, and what was great, both rose the game to actually getting there and they produced an aircraft for us that we'll have in 25 to do it. There's no doubt we're challenging the government, challenging our suppliers. We're putting our own money into sustain, uh, sustainable aviation fuel, uh, 100 million of our money and 100 million of Airbus's US uh, to actually develop an industry here. And I've no doubt with that, those signals, that investment, uh, that we'll get to our targets and maybe win beyond them because those challenges do work. And, and I think, Ellen, you're right. We love to punch above our weight in Australia, don't we? And I think, um, you know, there are so many challenges. You, you know, carbon offset markets around the world, they're challenged. I, I feel like there's so much opportunity in Australia. Yes, there's the natural resources, there's the land mass, and you put it together with the technology, because that's the other thing. Yes, we've got natural resources, but we actually, we adopt technology. We've got world-class technology and certainly from a mobile network point of view, which is going to play an important role. Um, you know, we're among the top few in the world with Telstra's network. And so I think that ability to step into some of these spaces um, and, and be a world leader and help solve these challenges, that's what excites me. You put them together. Um, we're doing a, a project at the moment with a carbon farm because we decided, okay, there's so many challenges in the carbon offset market, finding quality projects and the amount of work you've got to do, let's look how we invest. And so that's exciting where we're using drones and artificial intelligence. And, you know, I, you look at Australia, we're doing a small project, but there is huge opportunity. And I love that marrying together of the natural resources. You get the policy settings right. You get us as big corporates working collaboratively on it and you bring the technology into it and and i think we're in a great position to take a leading role so um we're out of time um i just wanted to say a very big thank you to the panel members um what i hear from you is that our um, australian ingenuity and spirit and competitive nature mm -hmm. um, is something that can drive us all forward so um with that thank you very much <laughs>